Good evening, everybody. Nope. Oh, just the last person in. Ah, good evening. <clears throat> um, looks like pretty familiar small crowd tonight, which is which is all right. Oh, here we have some more people. Coming in. All right, so we'll get started. Um, good evening again, everybody. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Stephen Gamboa Diaz. I'm the subdune, sub dean <laughs> of the New Haven AGO. And I want to welcome you back uh, for a second uh, session of our workshop on improvising in 17th and 18th century styles, uh, presented by Ethan Heyman and hosted by the New Haven chapter of the American Guild of Organists. Um, we're recording this session so that you can review it later. Um, and if you go to our website, newhavenago.org, uh, I need to review the first session. You can find a link to YouTube uh, there as well. Um, please keep your microphone on mute so that the recording can be as good as possible. And uh, you'll be encouraged to unmute and turn on your video so you can participate um, at spots where Ethan invites you. And in about an hour, around 7 p.m., we'll take a short break so that we can uh, get to the second half of the workshop with renewed energy. Um, so I want to welcome Ethan, um, who is from California. Um, and he is currently organist and assistant conductor at Naroton Presbyterian Church in Darien. And in addition to that, he is uh, pursuing a Master of Musical Arts degree at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music. And in addition to being a talented organist, he's also a gifted composer and improviser, as well as an avid linguist who speaks over eight languages. I don't know what the current count is for you now, but I'll let you tell everybody. Um, so looking very much forward to uh, learning more about improvising in these styles, and I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Ethan. Thank you, Stephen. So nice to see you all again. Um, so today's agenda, I want to go back and review a little bit about our Proscalia and our uh, counterpoint, species counterpoint, and then move on to my favorite form, which is the choral prelude, because it is one of the most versatile, often used forms that I, I use on a, on a regular basis almost every Sunday. So um, first, I think we can stop the recording and just let it be participatory for now and then we'll, we can put it back on sounds good okay i'm going to share my screen and you should share the sound too okay so first just want to go back and, and review a little bit. So last time we looked at species counterpoint, uh, which was um, you know, famously put in the book uh, Gradus ad Parnassum by Johann Josef Fuchs in 1725. Um, and I've adapted this to improvisation. So last time we looked at, uh, about a month ago, looked at the different intervals. And the important things to note here are that Perfect intervals have the most ability, and sixth and thirds have are imperfect, but they're still consonant, so less stable. And um, these are the most dissonant over here, the most unstable, the seventh, the fourth, the second, the tritone. And we looked at the different types of motion. So you hold one note and another one moves, Good. then it's oblique. Uh, if you have two voices moving contrary to each other, we call it contrary motion. And then you have parallel and similar motion. And in improvisation, we want to emphasize oblique motion, uh, contrary motion, and parallel motion, because these are the easiest for us to use. They automatically fulfill rules. Contrary is a little difficult because you have to see what intervals you're doing, but if you lock into your thirds or sixth, then you are uh, totally fine. And if you do oblique, where you hold one note and the other one 
goes, there are no rules there because you can just keep going without without the rules. Um, and let's move down to this. And then we looked at the the general form of what we're trying to do. We want to start at rest, get into a tension, and then release um, in every phrase. So then I I gave these exercises where you can practice this. Uh, the first species is you do consonant intervals everywhere, no dissonance. The second species is you do two against one, and you can do dissonance, but only as a passing tone, like here. And the third species is four notes against one, where you hold one and you have four moving around, um, like this. And the, the consonants, the, uh, the downbeat still has to be a consonance all the time. So you have that backbone of the first species within this third species. And the fourth species is where you have what we call ligatures, where you have suspensions in between notes, um, like so. And you can start this in second species, then jump into suspension chain, or you can just go straight into a suspension chain. And then finally, we arrived at our gradus ad parnassum, our parnassus of this, these steps, the florid counterpoint, where you put all of it together and um, and it, it becomes like natural counterpoint. And then from this, uh, we made these into pasacalias. Um, well, we, we went to the um, compound lines first to, to show that you need these pillar um, at the downbeat to be consonant, but after that, you can be dissonant, or you can you can basically follow the two voice counterpoint within one line. Um, and then we took that and made pascalias with it. So, going from one repeating bass line to adding one voice, adding another voice, adding some chords, adding certain things to to make it grow. Uh, gradually, and there we are. And about at seven o'clock after the break, we'll listen to some of your um, improvisations on these. Um, but now I want to get over to the new stuff. So the new stuff is uh, crop preludes, which are some of the most often used forms in our uh, canon. Uh, with you know Bach, Buxtehude, all of this uh, Baroque music using this. So, what's a? How do you ornament a crowd melody? First, it's just kind of like compound line, where remember I had the Golden Gate Bridge analogy. You have pillars; these are your notes, and you want to hit those notes. And if you hit them in the right way with the counterpoint, then you're fine. First, I want to just focus on the soprano line or the melody line. So in a ornamented chorale, you have the original chorale and you use these as the pillars and then you ornament in between. So think of it like that suspension bridge kind of thing. Um, and you can ornament it many different ways. You can put scales in the middle uh, trills, mordants, arpeggios, you, um, well, not arpeggios as much, but, but most often you see trills, mordants, scales, some kind of linking thing, and we'll look through some repertoire to see that. Um, and just like in the Pasakaya exercise, remember how I was talking about what makes a good Pasakaya, and I gave this example. I said, what's bad about this? Um, said what's bad about that is it's not consistent so what we want is we pick one motif or one idea and we we put it in so let's say I have my idea of I'm going to go 
that's my idea. I do um, three, four, five, then I can keep that consistent. And I keep running with the melody, with that, that idea. Same thing for here. You want to have one core idea, usually derived from the corel itself, and then you add it into the texture, you, you ornament with it. Um, and you want to make sure that uh, you accentuate the melody itself above everything else. You don't go far from it. So um, here is an example of Buxtehuda doing this nicely with his Nun bitten fear, den Heiligen Geist, uh, chorale setting. And you can see right here we have the chorale. The original chorale goes like this. So that first phrase. Now let's let's go and trace wh what happens in the melody line of his crowd prelude. So first you've got this G, and it's right here. Can you see the cursor? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, so you got the G here, and then you can trace the A. These two A's. Well, you have A here and A here, and then you have this G G E. So basically, he took these and they became the half notes in his setting. And you can trace it all the way through, D, G, G. So here's where it goes to. So there's your first line. And now I'm gonna play the original melody and then play what he did with it. So here's the original. Here is the Crow Prelude version. So you can see here that mostly it's going around the notes. And then here it goes to the two Gs and you get some freedom. You get a little scale going up and then you have this going here, uh, this little credential, a trill and, and resolution. Um, so that's an example of something that you can do. And here it gets a little more elaborate. Let's go to the second line. Um, okay, so you have B, I'll play the original. And it ends here. And let's see what he does in, in this ornamented melody. So this is interesting. Here he hits the G and then puts a little tail on it. You can see this little arpeggiation. So there's another idea we can put into our toolkit. And let's go to the third line. So E. there and here you see when you have a bunch of repeated notes he boosted it takes the opportunity to make a little you know alternating written out trill so you go Here he 
breaks this up and, and goes, makes this a little more elaborate. But you can see how you have your original, and what happens is all of the original notes are on the downbeat. And if they're there on the downbeat, you've already gotten most of it, well, you just need to accentuate it with your ornamentation. So um, notice that all of the ornamentation kind of pushes to the side, it pushes towards the bar line. You don't really have it right at the beginning. Um, and, and we'll look more at that, but see how it's main note, ornament to main note, and then another main note with the ornament there, main note, ornament. So we can take all of this uh, improvisation, a lot of it is you look at your repertoire and see what you're playing and try to pick it apart. Instead of playing like a performer, look at it as a composer and see what is it that makes the music tick. And we will look at that a lot uh, for this session. How, how does this get put together from the composer's perspective? And for us, it's the improviser's perspective. What can I take from the repertoire that is doable spontaneously, uh, that isn't too complicated, that you can instantly put in into something that you're making up on as you go along. Um, now I want to move down to this. So what kind of ornaments can we do? Well, Bach has this nice ornament table that we have from um, his, his book for one of his sons, Wilhelm Friedman Bach. And you can see the main things we have are trills, mordants, which we're all familiar with, and then different combinations of trills and mordants. You can trill and then mordant. Um, so, so here's a trill. Let's... So here's the trill. Or you can go CPC. Or you can do the trill in the morning. Or this is a cadence, like a turn, you can go around. But basically, these are all just combinations of three main little ornaments that you can use the trill, the mordant, and the accent. The accent is something like this. Uh, where you have your main note and you fall into it or you fall up to it uh, on the beat. Sometimes it's off the beat, it, it depends on the context. Um, and you can take these accents and put them together with other ones. So here is an accent with a mordant. Or um, here's an accent with the trill. But you get the idea that here you have basic different iterations of these uh, same ornaments. So, and you can put tails on them too. So here's like, or you call it cadence or um, instead of just the trill. Or you can put the tail going this way. Uh, various types. And you can even put a tail, a trill, and an ornament, uh, mordant uh, here. Or here. And so what I've distilled this into is uh, what, what is the function of these? Basically, mordants accentuate. So they go on the beat, usually. You don't really want to put them off the beat because then you're accentuating different syllables. You, you want to get on the right syllable. So usually you'll see this on, in 4-4, four four, you'll see it on the first of the measure, the third beat of the measure, things like that. Uh, trills enhance dissonance or the tension. So if you have a, um, if you have a cadence, it's usually, so you have this dissonance, it's the cadential, want of the seventh to move up. So that's the underlying harmony. The five to one. And then the trill just takes this dissonance and accentuates. And then a trill, okay, so that's the trill of the morning. Um, the accent delays the resolution. So if I've landed already, I can make uh, landed on the on the first of the the tonic chord or something like that. You've landed on your 
cadence, then you use this accent to kind of uh, push the resolution a little bit away so you can go. So let me just show you how that these look on the keyboard. Okay, so if I have, uh, let me move these aside so you can see. I want to line these up because if you don't, it kind of looks strange. Okay, there we are. So, uh, Morden, you you have your chord, a C major chord, and you accentuate it. And then, let's see, you have uh, a trill. You can. accentuate that dissonance that was there. And then the accent, you have uh, you have this resolution and you add an accent. Now you'll notice that this is often used in French classical music. So a lot of these ornaments make the national styles come out in different ways. So, you know, German Baroque will have a lot of mordens and a lot of uh, trills, and French classical music will use a lot of accent with trill or sing, and you just hear it. See, so using a lot of accents, using a lot of mordens and trills in that manner, I can sound more like French classical, or I can put it into a strict four and use some of these and I get German style, German kind of style. So the amount of ornaments and where you place them is is important for making things sound uh, differently. And this is a little fun thing that I like to do with my students. Um, how many ornaments should you use in your uh, crop prelude or anything you do in Baroque style? Uh, it's a question of taste. I like to use Christmas trees as my example. So, some participation. Which Christmas tree do you think is the best one here? Or maybe not the best, you have different tastes, but tasteful. Yeah, okay, so I'm seeing the chat, the middle one. That's my favorite too. Okay, why though? So this one has form to it, definition perfect triangle of a Christmas tree. And it has the nice garlands and the ornaments aren't obstructive. It's just enough to give you, show you what the form is, but not enough to obscure. Now, the left one is our, you know, our famous Charlie Brown Christmas tree, which is really cute, but it's kind of bare bones. You just have a little tiny thing and some ornaments. And then you've got this monstrosity on the right, and this is just way too much. It has ornaments everywhere. Like you can't even see the tree at this point. So that's what I liken it to with the uh, crowd play. So let me show you the musical version of what I mean with this. Uh, and I'll switch the keyboard for that. Okay, so let's say I have, well, actually, let me show you the theme. So I like to use this um, very familiar hymn that uh, most people know, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past, as uh, one of the first ones to use with this because it's a, it's a very easy theme and it, it, it gives you a lot of opportunities. So here we are. So 
let's just start with that. And get my out. So some examples. If I'm doing too little, it sounds kind of like this. And note that this is subjective, but you, you kind of figure out for yourself what, what you want to do with it. Um, but here's what I think is like too simple. So, so maybe I would do something like, so that one I can kind of tell I'm ornamenting, but it's not all the way there. I, I'm kind of just playing what was there. Uh, and then let's go into, I'm going to play what I think is like the right hand Christmas tree. Okay, so if I did something like... Right, now we're kind of missing the tune. It, it's kind of not there, uh, maybe a little too much. What I think is tasteful is you kind of limit it to maybe one or two ornaments. So here's the good Christmas tree. Right, so you kind of you still have a definite sense of that is my tune, and I hear the tune. Uh, now, some common mistakes with ornamenting is you you lose the tune when you're ornamenting. So a lot of my students, when we're doing this in improv classes, will go something like, um, okay, so, sorry, I'm gonna try to make a mistake. Let's, let's, let's go, okay. Right? So you kind of lost a definition. And usually what happens with that is you, you lose the sense of one and three has the two. So what we want to watch out for is you have these as your pillars. As long as your pillars are there, then you're fine. Um, going back to here, let's see. So let's see. yeah, so we can use this example. As, as a model. So maybe on the beginning, um, you can just try to copy. You just go. And you can do some kind of scale or something at the end. Um, but sometimes you can just take repertoire and get ideas exactly from that. And sometimes you can, uh, and when, once you get familiar with that, you can make up your own. So let's see. I kind of want to stop there and, and ask for questions. Any, any questions so far? Or the other thing is anyone want to try this? You can uh, open it up for participation really quick. basically taking this tune and, and making a ornamented version of just this first phrase. Stephen, can I call on you to, <laughs> to yeah, try? Yeah, sure, I'll try. Let's see. Let's see. Can you hear my keyboard? Mm -hmm. We got it there. I have like um, five screens. <laughs> Um, so just the melody, just the first line. Yeah. Very nice. Very nice sense of pulse and everything too. Um, so one interesting one is uh, Stephen did 
one that isn't in, in that chart where you can do escape tones. You can. So he went here. Um, so going from the A, instead of going G, you can go A, B, G. Um, and, and he had a nice sense of these uh, scalar figures in between. So very nice. Thank you. Uh, let's see. And if there's no questions, we can move on to so the way I like uh, students to practice this is uh, here's a list of melodies that I've created and um, you can see that they're based on order of difficulty so the difficulty is the contour changes so here you see it going up and then it goes down and cadences and goes around and here you have that. And here, you, for example, you have one that's going down and up with a leap and going all sorts of places with a leap and coming back down. Uh, I also use this for harmonization practice, but for this workshop, I just want to focus on you know, using, using melodies and, and doing crop preludes on them. So I, I'd suggest a, a good way to practice this is you just go through and kind of like, for example, the first one I have. And I can start easy by making them quarter notes and just uh, putting, putting something in between. can try elongating, elongating it, uh, making more space in there to, to add more ornaments. So So that's something you can experiment with. You you take the melody and you elongate little by little and see what kind of uh, ideas can you come up with within there. Uh, and then let me go down to something more complicated, uh, like the C major one. So this one is. OK, so something like that, I can go. Now, leaps are a, a, a great place that you can put little flourishes. So. Something like that. Um, yeah, so that's it with those. Now, that's just the melody line. To get this into real music, we want to get all of it. Um, you soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And usually what I do for my classes is we, we go from that and then we learn how to improvise harmonization. So we go from two voice harmonization like we did with the uh, species counterpoint, and then we add a third voice, and we add a fourth voice. But for this workshop, I wanna show you a shortcut where actually you don't have to know that to be able to do a chorale prelude on the hymns that you play in uh, church or concert. So let me show you what I mean by that. So to me, the hymnal is a cheat sheet because these are your, all your pillars are right here you, and it is correct already. So remember what I said about uh, suspension bridge analogy. If you have your pillars here, you can fill them with oblique motion or contrary motion. Um, or, or thirds and sixths as parallel motion, and you will be always correct. So if I go with the melody line, I go. Right, I can do that. I can do the same thing simpler in 
a um, in another voice. So for example, I can take the tenor and the alto and I make a third voice between this bass and the soprano uh, by making a, a little line that swoops in between them. So example, I can go from this E to the C to the A to the C, C, A. And, and watch, I'll do it in slow motion. So I'll go E. And I can end here for my for my ending of that phrase. And what that does, I will go to the real organ now. So basically what I did is put a second species inside of my first species carafe. And I will do this. See what I mean. Okay, I'll have an oboe here. And the hymnal is not cooperating. Okay, that's better. Okay. So I, I have my original soprano and my, uh, my original bass. They go. And then now I can put second species in the tenor slash alto. Yeah, I'll just added a texture into this hymn, which makes it no longer just a hymn, but it sounds like a crowd prelude. Uh, and you'll see as we go along how we can we can do this in various different ways using Bach and Buxtehude or any of your repertoire that you see as your models for textures that you can, you, you basically steal the texture from a different piece and you put it onto your onto your hymn or theme of choice. And what we do is once we have a lot of these models in our heads and we can do them, then we can be creative with them. Just like we did first species, second species, third species, led us up to the fifth species where you can be creative in the same way. This is exactly it, you use models. It's like uh, you're learning language and you learn, you know, I go to the classroom. Well, then you can be creative and go, well, what if I say I go to the store, I go to the park, you know, so you start adding in your own things. Same way we do it in music. Uh, so let me go down to here and look at some models. Okay, so I've I've discussed the pillars and the model improvisation. That's what we call model improvisation. You you take a favorite piece, you analyze the parts, and then you apply it to something else. So it's a model improvisation because we follow the same same form. Um, so here I'm going to show a bunch of uh, pieces from Bach's Orgelbuchlein, and uh, the improvisation does not need to be harmonically complicated. What you want to get is the texture. Uh, and the, these can work for uh, patterns to use here. And this chorale theme uh, I'm talking about is that one up, up there I showed. And then you can try, notice that it's all quarter notes. So this is a theme with all quarter notes. This is really good for chorale prelude. Uh, like if you look in your hymnal, anything like this, uh, by Bach or anything, you just flip in your hymnal. If, if it's one of those that kind of like, um, let me just show, show one that's really not fit for this. Well, okay, I'll make one. But basically, some of the modern stuff with like less rhythm doesn't really work well with crowd food. If it goes like. That's, that's not so good. But you, you kind of know what I mean. There's some in the hymnals 
that are kind of really dotted, really um, maybe not as much in the Himalaya I may need to, but uh, uh, I actually I see one. Okay, so like. More chordal and not as much um, not not as much quarter note motion things like that. So you want to find stuff that looks like a corral basically and and use that. Uh, let's go back here. Okay, so this is an easy or kind of one to try on your own, which I kind of demonstrated in a half version, and now we can. To it in a full version. So, Ikusu Dir Her Yesu Christ, this one um, is very famous. Let me play you the melody. And those of you with perfect pitch, I will be transposing it into the repertoire version, even though you see E minor original here. Uh, okay, so the original goes like this. Maybe people are still driving or stuff still, but I want to open it up and see if you can find the melody here. So does anyone want to try uh, looking at this and and telling us where the melody is? Like how has it been transformed? Ethan, are you uh -huh. asking about the Bach piece? Oh, yes. Yes, right here. OK, so th this is a lot like the um, the outline of the St. Anne that you did with the moving the second species counterpoint in the middle. Mm -hmm. So we've got you've got the base, uh, the bass line as a nice eighth note pulse. The melody is ornamented, ornamented very simply in the soprano line. And then there's that moving combination voice between a tenor and alto. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you. So now we, we've cracked the code of this uh, corral setting. So now we can take it and use it for our own purposes. So let's try that on the St. Anne uh, here. And I'll switch back to that. Okay. Okay, so to make this sound like a Sudir, we take this, we use simple motion here, and then we put a little bit of ornamentation crescendoing to this cadence. That gets the source soprano line. And then we do the alto tenor um, uh, alternation, but with what we'll call third species, because it's four notes to one note. And uh, like Caesar said, we will take this bass line and we will pulse it. So now I will improvise for you what we get when we do that. see how this is very useful for if you want to take a hymn like this and you make, let's say you're about to go into communion and you need something for two minutes, you can easily take a chorale kind of hymn you're doing, put this overlayer on top of that and, and try to do it that way. Um, so there's, there's one good model. It, it works especially for Lent or Advent kind of um, slower movements. And it's a good contrapuntal workout. And notice that you don't have to think of the counterpoint. You just go between. Now, a question I often get from this is, well, how do you know exactly what you're going to do in the tenor and alto? Because that's the creative section. Basically, if you find
find the chord. So here you see G, C, E, this is C major, and then we have another C major. You, you can land on, um, you find the overall notes here and you land on them to get to your next one. So, so you have tenor, alto, and these are kind of your vertices and you swoop back and forth between them. So I was going E, G, C. Now I'm already at C, what do I do? I can do a written out mordant. So what I was going is E, G, C, B, C, because that will accentuate the C here. And then I just did a little scale, C, D, C, B, A. So let me kind of graph it out with my mouse and show you by playing at the same time. So my tenor is going. because we didn't want to have just open fifth here. I wanted to get to this e. um, But you can see you can do it that way. Now, it doesn't have to be tenor alto either. You can go, uh, let's say you can go just on the tenor. You can go. So you see that you can Basically, you have your soprano melody, you ornament that, but then you're also ornamenting a little bit underneath using the counterpoint laws that we learned. Um, let's see. So now let's look at another one. Um, this is one of my favorites uh, to play at the beginning of the year every year. Das Atelier begangen ist. The last year has passed away, has gone away. So this one, what's going on? Anyone want to try doing a little analysis? That's all right, I'll, I'll do it, okay. Um, so here we have the original melody, we have So just looking at the soprano, this is a little bit more ornamented than our, our other one. Okay, so there's a lot going on right there. Basically, it starts plain, and look at this crescendo build. You have um, this G, F becomes G, F, E, F, E here, and then going up to the A, and he does a little escape tone, and this is a little accent. Now, remember before I said mordants don't really belong on the second and fourth beat, but when it is uh, fast enough, no, slow enough, when it's slow enough, it, it's actually okay. Here it would be more like, since the pulse is four and one, it would be more weird for it to be on the and, but it's okay on four here. And then you have the G. So instead of resolving to, he did this little accent. So, and in Baroque times, this accent kind of thing is, Kind of a sad emotion it, it kind of you know denotes the little sighing or um weeping that kind of thing uh and then here okay so we're going from g to e does this so he goes all the way up to there to go to this and this is a great example of sometimes you don't have to exactly hit the note on the beat 
you can see that this is important because the text is vergangen ist. So this one's important and this one's important. You, so he hits this G on the beat and then goes down to F. And then what do we have here? It's a Nachspiel. So you can do little scales in between your, um, your chorale phrases. So here you, you've ended. And then he starts the new melody here. And then you can follow that along. Like that. Okay, so that's the soprano. And then we have this here. So this is kind of a crescendo of, it, it's technically a passus durius is what he's doing. It's the chromatic raising to show the, um, it's another uh, figure that's showing suffering, uh, sadness, but here we can take that idea and not necessarily use the exact chromaticism. We can just take this idea as, okay, I can have my soprano start and then I have an alto entering and then I have a tenor entering uh, and my bass enters to make a little cadence. So now, if I take that to our original um, theme, there we go. Okay, so this is in the style of Das Alte Jahr begangen ist. Just, just to analyze that really quickly. Um, so I just did this plainly, and I did the soprano starting to ornament here. I kind of followed the alto line. I did a just a slow eight note here, and added this in the tenor, and followed that, and then put in the pedal. Um, I kind of went A G F. Yeah, I ended here. A G F. E, D, G, G, C. So I was ornamenting the bass line a little bit, but this was mostly just playing the notes and kind of put it dot, dotted, uh, written out words on them. And then I put a little tiny uh, appreciation here where I went, because I was inspired by the books to Huda and kind of mixing them up. Uh, and then I restarted here. And you can, um, yeah, you can hear the pacing. I was trying to make it exactly uh, with the same tempo and trying to elongate in the same way. So I wasn't going, you know, G, E for a long time, and then A, G. I was trying to hit each one. Uh, as so. And I see it's seven o'clock, so I think we should have a break. But, and I'll see you in five minutes.
<laughs> All right. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Ethan, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, that's great. So uh, we'll see you, I guess, about 7.06. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. Cool. So we'll let you get going with the second half and uh, we'll see we'll see how it goes, but <laughs> I'll give it a stab as best I can too. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. I'll I'll start with I think I'll just continue with the lecture portion and then we can move to the participation at the end when we stop the recording. Yeah. Sounds great. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna share screen again. I want to make sure, can you hear this when I play? Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, so before the break, we left off with um, using as models Iku Sudir and uh, Das Altayara from the Orgo Buch line by Bach uh, as models for improvisation. And now I want to go to Another one. First, I want to make a little note. Basically, when we say chorale preludes, um, chorale preludes is an interesting term because it's not exactly one uh, one exact thing. It's a genre, and there's many different ways of doing it. So, what I'm showing you now is what we call the ornamented chorale prelude. That's where you have you can see here. Um, so you have basically harmonization and you uh, with a texture and you have your melody going on. Now you've also got other kinds. You've got like, there's chorale motet kind of chorale preludes where say you have, um, you have a fugue that starts each line uh, and then you bring in the melody uh, at the end of each line. You've also got, well, you've got all sorts. Basically, a chorale prelude is you take a chorale and make a prelude out of it, which is why we call it chorale prelude. And the easiest one to improvise is the ornamented chorale prelude. So just want to give you that context and before we move on uh, to this one. This is a favorite, Omenj Bivan Dein Sundukos. You can see here, let's see. Uh, so here we have E flat. This is the original. Okay, so there's our original melody. And now this one is very heavily ornamented uh, compared to the last two. And you can see this right here. And I play you the melody by itself. really heavily ornaments this one. But some of the same rules apply. 
you have most of the ornaments are you have a mordant starting here uh, you have a trill enhancing this passing tone motion uh, you have uh, mostly you have a note and then you lead away from it with with an ornament now what's going on um, oh also one note one note here uh, everything that you do learning repertoire like um, all of our teachers have taught us to you know articulate in the right way or um, put fermata when you have a fermata here you put the breath before you go to the next phrase everything that you do for repertoire it's important to learn repertoire because you take the exact rules and put them on your improvisation so part of what makes a great improvisation is you play it as if what you're creating is repertoire and you do all of the same sort of rules in, in that style so here you can notice i was putting a little uh, breath here and all of that um now moving on to the bottom lines what's going on i think of this kind of like bach was um kind of inspired by the de Quigny, uh de Tiasantai kind of motion where you have a slow brooding under layer and then you have your little uh, solo up here so what's going on is actually not that complicated in the bass and tenor alto these lower voices you can see that here's your original chorale notes and then he kind of just puts little passing tones and um goes steps in and out of them um here's a little written out um mordant before the note uh here it's it's just little chromaticizations going in between um for example here is a leading from in the alto line from You can see this, but but notice the motivic uh, continuity. So you've got ta 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 ta, and here you've got ta 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 ta, and there and there and there, and it comes from this melody part here. Uh, so you notice that you can flood it here in the bass, everything. Uh, he's very consistent with taking one motivic line and and making it. So let's put this onto our original theme. So this is meant to be mine as a model of improvisation. Um, that I didn't exactly follow the model. And that's what happens uh, basically when you're improvising. Sometimes you notice, oh, well, this thing in the model doesn't exactly follow, it doesn't exactly work with this theme. So you adjust. So one thing I adjusted was 
um, at the Pramada sections like here, I was thinking, mm, it doesn't feel right to just jump into the next one. So I kind of elongated them and, and added. So you can, you can change some stuff. Um, another thing I was thinking was I got to this ending phrase and we all know that Omanj Bivine at the very end has some of the most juicy harmonies that Bach ever wrote for organ. It's, it's just amazing how, what he did at the end. And I was thinking, hmm, how am I going to pull that off? And then I went, wait, you don't have to. Like, if it's improvisation, you can just take the idea, not everything, because there's no way I can compete with that, those interesting chords there. Uh, so yeah, so there's that one. And then now I've been showing you a bunch of slow brooding ones. Now I want to show you a fast one to show you something you could use other things. Because what I want to drive home is Crowd Prelude is a genre, basically. It's not one thing, and it can be used for many. First, it's so versatile. You can use it for many things. So here is, um, ironically, I'll mention Musin's Sterben. Everyone must die. It's very dark, but it is a very lively setting that Bach does here. So, um, here's the curl melody. So there's that, and then what Bach does with it is, I think it's nice to just play this for you really quick. registration but on here the zoom will distort it so I, I'm gonna keep it just like that. Um, but you can see here so this is a good example of how Bach takes one melody and just puts it everywhere. So you've got this written out mordant kind of thing da, 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 and it's right before the beat uh, and accentuates to the latter half of the beat. Um, if you look here, you'll notice that actually the harmonies are pretty simple. So you have G major in this block, and then A major here, D major, G major. So it's exactly show, exactly following the, the chorale. Uh, and this is actually pretty simple to, to put onto our other hymn. So we can just see here, sometimes you don't have to ornament the chorale. This is actually just So in this case, everything else is being ornamented. Uh, and you can see this pedal part. Sometimes the pedal doesn't have to be structural. It can be a little, um, for example, this, this, uh, this morning at church, I, I played the Wir Glauben A on Menin Gott, the EWV 6. Well, I forgot the BWV number, but it's the famous one that goes on. <laughs> Right? And then in that one, the pedal has this line. Right? That has really nothing to do with what the hands are doing. It's just an added motif. It, it adds color to it. Um, same thing actually in, in the Orca book line, in Dearest Freuda. And the pedal goes. has ostinato. Um, that's, that's another example. Sometimes the pedal is more of an interjectionary kind of subject. It doesn't have to do uh, the bass. So here, it's actually this tenor line that's kind of doing the bass. We have... And then the pedal's going... Okay, so now let's move back to our theme and see if we can replicate it.
Okay, so I'm going to break this one down step by step. First, we have our theme. Tilt the camera down so you can see the hands. Okay. So I have that going on. And then I can take uh, this C and go. I'm going to play it for you here so you can see. And then it goes F to E. Noticing in the original, it's going third and sixth parallel, so I can do the exact same thing here. Um, I can lock it into my alto. So now I'm, I'm doing the tenor and alto together, but doing sixth verse and then locking it. Sometimes you have to get a little creative, but mainly as long as it's in the chord, it'll be correct. And just don't accent uh, some long notes. But, but notice I was taking the chord and just... So it's third, 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 sixth, or six, six, third, some, some kind of variation. Okay, so now I will uh, improvise uh, this one on top of this one. And then we'll get into some interesting creative stuff with this. Okay, so this is a good example. Sometimes the model is a little too complicated for uh, improvisation. So I just had trouble. I was thinking, hmm, what is going on here? Why are my left hand and pedal not working? And then I realized, OK, so I'm supposed to do the pedal offset with the hands. Sometimes it might get too complicated. So in this case, I might just say, uh, well, what is the character being driven by? I think the pedal is driving. So what I'm going to try now is just put chords in the left hand and do the character in my pedal. adjustments to it. Okay, so now I've shown you, uh, let's see, I showed you an example with just the melody, and then we did four examples by Bach. Now I want to show you why this is so useful. Okay, so no more handout anymore, but let's just go back to our, our theme that we're using. So I'm thinking of all the things I can do with this. Now it's time for creativity. So we saw examples of what Bach did. 
now you can make your own based on these elements. So I can do something like, okay, it's a prelude for the service and I need to make something that is, um, something that is slow and contemplative. So I can say, I want something that's an ornamented corral and uh, let's say I'm going to take these and I'm going to slow them down to half minutes. And then I can say, oh, well, the, the theme for today is about uh, winding river or river Jordan or something like that. I can say, OK, I need something that sounds like a river. So now what sounds like a river? I think some kind of stream of like, uh, 16 notes, something like that. And now I'm going to make a crop out of that. So um, here we go. Do something like this. something a little more upbeat so I can say what, what sounds upbeat well maybe some kind of leaping motion maybe I take the chords and I do I'm thinking something like this <laughs> soft and solemn. Um, I'm going to do, you'll see what I'm doing once I start. Tai kind of thing. Uh, I flipped my voices, so you can do this uh, a lot. Um, not so much in the Orgebuch line, but in box Leipzig chorales or the Klavier Ubu, you'll see choral preludes which have 
the melody is actually in the tenor or it's in the pedal playing the tenor or the pedal playing the bass, things like that. So you can, um, you can use your hymn cheat sheet and flip voices around and it actually would still work. So I took this soprano line and flipped it with the tenor and went and harmonized it just like I did the other way where I hit these notes, but um, this way. Now you might think, what were those? How did I do the part that goes from this chorale phrase to the next chorale phrase? All I was doing was just kind of repeating the harmony that was right here. So I go, um, and then I do something that embellishes that. is that it's consistent all the way through. It's, um, I am taking a single idea and, and making it go along. Now, this is the same way that you can do uh, your, basically, if you take a bunch of chorale preludes and put them together and play them right after each other, you get a partita. So if you take, uh, if you practice little by little, you take some of your favorite chorale prelude repertoire, you try to, uh, improvise in their styles and once you have them assimilated you can try putting them together and let's say you need five minutes for the prelude well you can say i'm going to improvise variations on the hymn uh, for five minutes and each of these will take maybe one and a half minutes then you've got four variations to work with and and you can you can try experimenting with that um now i want to show before we get to the end with um, everything, I kind of want to sum everything up, saying how can you turn this into a big post loot or something? Uh, everything that we've learned before. Basically, uh, the first one of the first forms I teach is you know ternary form. You have the A B A. I like to make a little exercise for my students where you take a crowd prelude as your A and as your B uh, as your A on the other side. And then as your B, you do a Pascalia. So that way you can have this kind of function and you'll see what I mean. So let's say, okay, it's a postlude. It needs to be a little more uh, joyful. So I can, I, the, the melody doesn't always have to be slow enough. So for Zoom, I'm gonna have to do a weird registration. Yeah, you might not. Uh, yeah, it's it's been pretty it. distorted. So oh, it still is. Yeah, so you might okay. be even quieter. Sorry. I'm okay. Quiet. Okay. So I'm gonna use eight foot flutes only, but pretend that this is playing. So just. Uh, is this still distorted? A little bit, yeah. Just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, oh, you know what I can do. I'll, I'll go to Zoom and turn down my microphone. That, that should help it. Ah, the microphone is all the way up. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> How about now? Yeah, that's better. Better. Yay. Okay. So I'll, I'll still leave it with that registration, but um, it's, that, that should help. Okay. So uh, try to follow along. I'll do the A first, and this is just me making some up, uh, pretending that it's okay. structure behind it if you if you go little by little you can uh, get to that and it's it's attainable 
Um, so that's my A section. Uh, and now I'm going to go to the B section. So sometimes I say, okay, I'm going to go to minor and do these things. But I want to show you how you can take your Pasacaglia exercise and put this together as an exercise. So I take each lead the last line, just the last little line. Here we have. So I end. And then now go straight into Pasacaglia. do exactly what is there but um, for here I'm just gonna take the general idea so you see how it goes C F G G C, C F G C to make it work I kind of need a C F G G C so I'll do that on Yes, it, will, it, it may take a while to, to get to that point, but you can see how exactly how you get there. It's just you take little modules of, of things and you, you kind of push them together like Lego blocks. And after you get all of the little modules in place, then you can start getting creative with them and, and see, um, just be like a composer who's trying to figure out how do you put this together. Uh, when, you're, when you're improvising, you, you just, See, well, when I tried to make this transition, it didn't work. You can think, what can I change to make that transition work? And for example, in my B section, uh, the Pascalia was working for the, for the first half, and then I, I said, oh, well, I need to go to A minor, give some contrast. Oh, well, now A minor is not working. I need to go to F and then G. And then maybe if I hold a pedal point, I can get back to C. Uh, things like that. So you kind of experiment and that's the whole joy and fun of this. You, It's creative. You get to pick what you want to do and uh, using all of this, these great resources of what Bach, Buxtehude, everything from before, we can uh, 
find what makes the music tick and and let us come up with our our own greatest. So that's the end of my talk, and I want to open it up for questions now. Or anyone want to try anything? Um, I had a question about if you had like go to so like your uh, your like very end of your improvisation that you just did uh -huh. you did uh like you extended the harmony oh and, yes and like and then there's like filler passages in when you did the ornamented chorale like if you had like any go to like you do this note you do like one four one on it or you do something else <laughs> like similar um yeah. yeah yeah well okay let's. Let's do the ending one first. Okay, so what I do for my go-to is Bach's go-to, and this was something that Frederick Blanc uh, taught me uh, in Paris, where he's saying, you know, you have to make it sound like it ends. And I was saying, what is he getting at? And then he demonstrated at the keyboard, and I instantly went, oh, it's the five of seven, no, the five of four. So you go, if you're in C major, uh, you go to the four, you're at one, you go to four, now go to the five of four, but then you put a seven, five, seven of four. Okay, so Bach does it all the time. You're at the end. Actually, let me, let me do this on this keyboard that you can actually see. I know it's laggy, but at least you can see the notes I'm playing. Um, so, C major, you want to end there. You go to the four, and what is this? The five of five, seven, and four. It's five, seven, four. So Bach does this all the time. You have C as your pedal note. So more simply, it's C major, C seven. F with a pedal, G, C. So, uh, even more basic. Those are your root reposition chords. So basically, it's just a little um, augmentation of your one four five, because you really want to. Uh, the broke times are interesting because. You know, it's this shift from modality to tonality, and you, they had this, you know, we take for granted, oh, I hear this, this key, I'm, I'm in this key. But for them, all of these pieces start with this kind of, you know, or, you know, it, it really shows I am in this key, I am in C major now, and they do the same thing at the end. So. You know, you do it, or so I say. That's a, a really common one, but the general go-to is at the beginning and end. You really accentuate. This is my key. That's how you sound baroque. You just you know one five one. Five. Okay, if you want to sound classical, actually, you go one five one five one. Like Beethoven, how many times can you end a piece? Right, there's there's a classical ending kind of thing. But then Baroque is a little more uh, you know, less gallant than that. You just And I'd say that kind of trill with a little ta dum is a go-to. Now, for the middle sections, going from a phrase of a crowd to the next phrase of the crowd, that one, basically, my go-to is repeating the end part. So let's say you go, right. um, okay, then I do the, the chords were four, five, one. Then I just do the four, five, one again without the melody. So I'll go. Like that. So I bridge it that way and it works. Usually it works everywhere. Uh, I'll try it on the third line now. 
Okay, so that was G major, A minor, D minor, E major. Okay, so. So you, you kind of just switch it that way. Uh, I think that's my go-to. I'd say in general, you can just do a, a one, four, five kind of thing. I, either in major or minor, it will, it will work. Thanks for that question. It's a very good one. Cool, thanks. Any more? And, and especially anyone want to try any of this and I can, I can help you with it? I just want to drive home the point that improvisation, we often think of it as, you know, someone's making it up as they go along, like that is only they can do that. But I think everyone can do it. And I especially think it, it is graspable if you take it in little tiny bite-sized pieces and you really understand it. There's actually so much that is predictable about it. It's not a, a art form that is exactly spontaneous more it's you have your um, certain things that you you know how to do your little techniques and you kind of take these techniques and put them on each other to me that's what improvisation is way more than it is making something up on the spot because you can see when i'm thinking about this i don't think of it as i'm going to make up a crowd prelude i think here's a crowd prelude it needs to have these characteristics what kind of characteristics in music can I do to emphasize what I want? Do I want loud, soft, things like that? And then you put it together and and using the techniques and the uh, repertoire that you know, you, you put together something. And I'd also say, don't be afraid of writing things down. Um, there's especially forms. Often we think, oh, if I write down my improvisation, it's a composition, not improvisation. But not exactly. If you just say, okay, I have a, I have my Sunday bulletin, or I have my concert uh, program, and I just say, uh, I'm going to do a choral prelude, and it does, um, soprano be ornamented, and left hand. Sometimes I sketch out little, like, little eighth notes for the left hand, and then I'll put like. Uh, like little shorthands um, to, to show myself what kind of rhythms I'm dealing with. Uh, that's a perfectly good way of, of doing improvisation too. Because often you have maybe 30 minutes before the service starts or the concert starts and you can say, um, you know, I, I know I'm gonna do something like this and that makes it less daunting. So when I used to do uh, my favorite thing, medley on uh, audience themes, but nowadays I just do it on the spot. People give me their themes, they call out pin numbers or say, and I just make something. But when I first started with it, I used to, the day before or an hour before, write out, okay, with the themes that people are gonna give me, I will write out, I will do some kind of overture, and then I will go into some kind of adagio, and then I will do a fugue or I'll do a Takata or something like I wrote out the forms and exactly what I need to do in them. That way, when the audience called out, you know, "Happy Birthday" and "Star Wars," then I can say, "Okay, well, the overture is going to be Happy Birthday," and then the I'm going to do a little adagio on Star Wars and then lead into a Takata that does both, something like that. But I say, don't don't be afraid of having organization to stuff to, to as you go along. Now, in addition to questions or um, are you trying things, you can also ask me to demonstrate any of the stuff we did before. If you want a recording of like a sample so you can go back and listen. I think, um... I had a question too. What would you recommend for someone? So like if someone isn't as confident like with their pedal work, what kind of stuff? Because we looked at like true organ chorales. 
Mm-hmm. Um, if there's things you'd recommend or like textures you'd recommend uh, for people that just want to do manual stuff. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so the first thing I'd say is to go look at pieces that are for that instrumentation. So um, if they want to do piano music, like go look at some piano repertoire and see what happens there. Because there's a lot of, there's like, for example, if a student's learning the Bach Italian concerto or, or just, that's one thing. I noticed that chorale preludes tend to be on organ and not uh, piano because the harpsichord stuff tends to be um, not on chorales. But you can still do a lot. You can look at the manual leader uh, movements in the Leipzig chorales. Um, you can, yeah, basically repertoire. Um, I'd say you can still do chorale preludes, still do pasacallas, things like that. But you just move your pedal into your left hand and kind of smush together the left hand pedal, everything that we learned. So um, for example, I can have, okay, my pascalia is right and then before I was saying like maybe put in your right hand and left hand right but instead of doing that if you're at piano or you have a student that's just doing uh, manuals only you can that's my left hand only and then I can put my right hand Okay, I'm doubling. Yeah, I, I'm so used to doing this with pedal and left hand side. It's hard for me to, to do it, but I'm gonna try. Like that. So you basically combine those two. If you're doing a uh, chorale prelude, you can, you just smush together the left hand and the pedal. So, um, let's see. So I was doing two voices in left hand, one over here. I was kind of cheating because I have this very tiny keyboard that I can do tens and fifteenths on. But um, but still, you can you can still do kind of texture things. One of the things to watch out for is uh, when you have it all in one hand, you kind of want to do more chordal than contrapuntal stuff because contrapuntal stuff can easily run out. When I have a pedal here and I have my left hand, I can do this easily. But when I'm here, I have to make sure this is all here. So I just lessen the kind of part. I just do like that. Now, a trick is that if you are doing a rhythm, even in within a chord, it still sounds like counterpoint almost. You can still do kind of fake counterpoint. Even the alternation gives you that pulse it still sounds like you're doing uh, that kind of rhythm and, and having flow under there. So very good question. It's, it's good. I, I'd also look at the French classical tradition because everything there is hands only almost. Um, that, that's a good one. Um, like the Clarembeau suites or let's see, what's this there? Like the Dumage. Um, yeah, there's a lot. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say this has been such a joy to teach all of you this and improvisation is my absolute favorite part of playing the organ. So thank you so much for having me on this. Yes, thank you so much, um, Ethan. It's It's been really great. I think we learned a ton and um, yeah, a lot to practice. Um, are there any more questions at all? Anything? I see, what are the languages that you uh, that you oh. speak. I know we had it in the bio, but okay. <laughs> what's the latest? Well, it, I'll, I'll give you the, the more detailed version. Okay, so I learned when I was a child, my mom was from Hong Kong, so that side of the family spoke it with me. And then I had a Portuguese babysitter, because this is San Francisco where uh, a lot of the babysitters happen to be Portuguese. 
Um, so I, I grew up with those two languages. And then I say those are kind of my key, my, the, the languages that gave me the keys to European and East Asian languages. So from Cantonese, I learned Mandarin. And then now I'm, uh, I've learned three semesters of Korean here at Yale. And I've just started learning Japanese, which is, I'll say, the hardest language I have ever learned. It's quite complicated. Uh, and then Portuguese, I've went from there to Spanish, to French, and now learning German. And German is the most complicated European language I've learned. So, but I, I love learning languages. And to me, I think music and language are the same. It, it's just in the same part of the brain for me, where it's all about hearing things a lot and processing how it is and then seeing how do you replicate how to do that back i think of improvisation as um as the speech the talking form of music whereas repertoire playing is the reading form of music mm. uh, yeah. nice cool well um thanks again and um it's been a joy to have you and i think everybody enjoyed it very much give a virtual round of applause can do thanks the so much little